psychotropic drugs as he sits at the defense table. So Stone Grissom, what do you as a defense attorney have to do? I mean, you have to really worry about the makeup of this jury. Can right. they understand his feeling of victimization? Well, yeah, we were talking about this in break, too. I mean, I think this case is won and lost from the defense side in voir dire itself, because mm -hmm. what you have to do is you have to get into the psychology of the jurors. You have to pick really the right people who can actually identify with this defendant, identify with the psychology of someone who would be so obsessed with somebody who would ultimately have a psychotic break uh, leading him to murder her and not necessarily have the intent to murder her. Um, it, it, not everybody's going to have that that ability to really identify with that type of person. Right. So it's and, so important to pick and, the right people. And the jury here is five men, five men. seven women, uh, four white males, one Latin male, six white females, one African American. Mm -hmm. But here's who they are. There's a customer service rep, medical equipment company owner, right. an employee of a supermarket, a postal worker, a Home Depot cashier, a couple of retired right. people. Is yeah. that good I, for you? Or? I don't like the owner. Um, I think what you want is probably in a general stereotypical sense you want more women than men. You want people that might have had boyfriends or might have had people that have emotional stalking propensities or, or that type of mm -hmm. experience um, but you also and more importantly you want people that have been bullied by society bullied by the people in authority you don't want people that are self-confident so the are, Home Depot cashier is a good one <laughs> they, they deal with the public all the time they've been screamed at uh, sure. you know the postal worker as well you want people that are in not necessarily positions of authority but positions where they might have that same life experience where they could identify with someone who has been so overwhelmed by life that and they would snap they overwhelmed. could just snap and remember one had a good demeanor too the, so did the prosecutor Stone Grissom if this had been your case would you have deferred your defense opening I, I think this case is one of those cases that you at least have to seriously consider reserving your opening statement why don't you want the jury to get an idea from the very beginning this is a man with a problem a mental obsession uh, an emotional problem I, I don't think you have to worry about that because the prosecution is going to hammer that into the jury's mind but they're going to they're going to give this evil bent on it um, in a case like this it's so important to really dive into the psychology to really give the jury that feel of spiraling into this obsession state to where you ultimately become out of control and when you start out just giving the whole story and then trying to piece it together you lose a little bit of that dramatic effect I mean he's, he has a very good demeanor on uh, you see that in the mm -hmm, opening statement mm -hmm. but every single witness if he did reserve that he could have previewed this journey, this this spiraling out of control through every witness that came on and asked questions like, did you talk to this person? Did you talk to this person? Did you get this information? Did you find out that he was depressed? Did you find out he was losing weight? So right. the jury knows something's coming. So when it's the, ca the prosecution's case is over, their case is really over. They don't have a chance to but or rebut what you're about to say. Then you get to stand up and say, the prosecution gave you half the story. Now I'm going to tell you the real story. So you wouldn't not give an opening statement. You would do it later. Right. You after would, you would, you would, you would want to reserve that because, because you want to take the momentum away from the prosecutor. You want to turn the mm -hmm. tables very quickly and then you then it's very important after you reserve that to make your first couple of witnesses very strong and just attack and really show your theme of this person that's going into this just as he titled his essay journey into obsession. You want to give the jury that feel so that the end when you say this brutal crime could have been committed by nobody other than someone who had this psychotic break, someone that was right. not like you and me, not reasonable, not acting in his right mind. He was literally out of control. And, you, and they believe that at that point, or at least that's the hope. Right. Todd, this man writes this 200-page, you know, uh, Odyssey, diatribe, diatribe. That's yeah, that's a better is. word. Uh, you had a similar case where one of your clients wrote, what, almost 50 letters to a girlfriend? Yeah, he was. it was a murder case, uh, multiple defendants, and he, while he was incarcerated in jail, he wrote 48 letters against the strenuous advice from his counsel, <laughs> saying, you. do not do this. Um, he wrote them to his girlfriend, which he detailed a lot of, not necessarily putting himself as the, the, the killer, mm -hmm. but putting himself in the crime scene and, and giving details that only someone that had been there during the, which the crime had been committed could know these certain details. And I only found out about it because I got it from the prosecutor in discovery, bait, neatly bait stamped and given to me as, oh, as evidence that was going to be used against him. Uh, and, so that, and, and the similar to this, it becomes a defense attorney's nightmare because you have all of sure. these statements that are out there that weren't cross-examined, that you had no control over, that were just... And your client's own words.
But so you won that case or lost that case? We ultimately won that case. And, and actually, that was a case where we reserved our opening because it had so many different elements that the prosecution was fighting against that we were able to. Mm -hmm. and, and really, we were able to use those letters to our benefit in the end. It, it actually helped our client. Yeah, but still, you don't want that kind You don't of want to have to go through that because it, you, know, you tear your hair out at yeah. night and it, you, know, you end up giving Alka-Seltzer a lot of uh, business. So. <laughs> Pepto-Bismol. Uh, jump, jump in. So. Um, well, okay, I, I, I want to agree with her in, in one aspect that I think the defense attorney is, is making a slight mistake when he's talking or focusing on Gloria Gomez. I think what he should be focusing on is that it doesn't matter what she would have been saying to him. She could have been telling him that she couldn't be with him because of her family. She could have been telling him other things. It didn't matter. She was going to die. He was just this, a ticking time he bomb. He was a ticking time bomb. And instead of putting the focus on her, they need to really put it back on him to make this not necessarily insanity. And I agree with you. You're kind of walking a tightrope when you're, when you're doing a heat of the passion. But that's inevitable. I mean, the heat of the passion defense in, is inherently a defense mm -hmm. in where you are arguing a psychotic break. Um, and it just walks that, that well, line between does. insanity and and, and... and not only uh, having clarity of thought to go get uh, different weapons, but taking money out of the bank, right. making airplane reservations. I don't care if he used his credit card or not. He was going to countries, right? He was going, that's, yeah, and that, that's what's important with the prosecution. Now, just to start back with the money, the premeditation, the prosecution is going to say that's evidence of premeditation. The defense, what we haven't, I don't think, heard yet, mm -hmm. is that that is what he was, he was really going to commit suicide. He was using this money, he was going to go to Europe. Uh, you <laughs> Europe want to Suicide. You could go into your living room and commit suicide. Right. You don't Europe have to go to Paris, France. Europe is a much more comfortable place to commit suicide, apparently. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> and you can get a really good meal there. Right. What's also um. What's also important? We were talking about this before. Is that he picked countries in which there they have public policies against the death penalty, and they have policies against extraditing people back to the United States who might face. So the that's death even more calculated. It, it's a, It's at least evidence of calculation from the prosecution side. The defense will say these are countries that he was familiar with. These are countries in which he spoke the language. Um, uh, what's also interesting is that he, he made at least one phone call before the murder, the day before the murder, to Brazilian airlines. We don't know what they talked about. It was what's just their extradition policy? Their extradition policy is the same as, as France and, and the other countries he went to, is that if the, he, uh, a person is facing the death penalty because they have a public policy against executing people, they're not going to extradite them. See, uh, you know, Tanya, I think maybe he should have been a prosecutor the way he's thinking well. here. <laughs> anyway, they're telling me... The, uh, the state's uh, way in that regard. And I'd like to follow up on a question uh, dealing with that intent. If he wrote that, or if your argument was that he wrote that with the intent to give that to law enforcement when he arrived back in the United States, how did you deal with the issue of also arguing to the jury that he went to Europe to, for the first place to actually commit suicide or do himself in if he ultimately had the intent to come back and, and turn himself in? Well, he, he brought that document with him only because he was